Welcome to this session of organizational behavior. Today we will be talking about emotions and moods. The primary learning objectives today is to talk about the different dimensions of emotions and moods, what are the relationships between them and how it's how these emotions and moods affect uh, organizational behavior. So what are the different theories behind this? What are the researchers saying about the trends of emotions and moods across the working force um, in different countries? And eventually, why it's important for us to know more about it and how the managers and the leaders can be more effective knowing to deal with emotions and moods of the workforce. So when we talk about these emotions and moods, as we have mentioned in our learning objective slide, uh, in organizational behavior, it's very important to better understand the roles of emotions and moods. Back in the days, it was kind of irrelevant uh, among the managers to talk about different emotions, different uh, mood related anxieties or reactions because people were expected to work in an emotion free environment and emotion they, they believed the common belief was that emotions interfered with productivity it's a disruptive thing so we should we should always separate it from the actual workforce actual professional work but now we know based on our different findings and based on social perception that we cannot really um, separate this slide talks about the relationship between emotions and moods the overarching group of feelings the broad range of feelings are defined as affect within that if we look further emotions usually is caused by specific events and uh, those events can be very brief in duration. Usually those are accompanied by distinct facial expressions and emotions are usually action oriented in nature. Whereas when it comes to moods, uh, these are more generic and longer lasting. Uh, and you usually when we talk about mood, uh, people cannot uh, trace back to any specific event it's a range of events over a period of time that can result in and define uh, a mood of a person and then usually it's cognitive in nature the book also talks about different types of emotions there are a variety of it uh, but the researchers overall talks about the six essentially uh, universal emotions like anger, fear, sadness, happiness, disgust, and surprise. We can also place them um, in a series where the adjacent two can be a bit confusing uh, when you are looking into it or people are uh, trying to differentiate between two adjacent uh, emotions so at the one end in the extreme left uh, we can see happiness and in the extreme right we have disgust but then happiness uh, is uh, adjacent to surprise surprise is near fear and then from fear we see sadness anger and disgust whereas we, we when we talk about uh, mood we see that a group of or different groups of uh, emotions actually uh, we can set together we can perceive together uh, and those define different varieties different sorts of mood of human being those can be highly negative uh, where we are seeing the emotions of uh, being upset stressed and nervous and tense uh, at the same time, it can be also have a highly positive effect or highly positive mood, being alert, excited, elated, happy. 
overall, these moods and emotions are very, very critical when we talk about decision making. As we have seen in our uh, first couple of slides, initially people were thinking that in a professional world, in the real world, when we are dealing with money, we are dealing with people, we are dealing with services, customers, uh, productions, uh, different logistics, uh, the decisions are, ma are made rationally uh, without any emotion. But that's not the case here anymore. It has been proven that when we are talking about making any decision, we are thinking the cognition part is there, but at the same time, feelings, human feelings, have a huge part to play uh, in those decision-making process. Now, all the emotional decisions that we make, in addition to the cognitive behavior that we have, are these all ethical? The studies have shown um, we have read in the book and I also experienced in different case studies that have uh, used before in, um, in different classes and in real life that uh, human being when they're dealing with different kind of activities um, out there uh, in the society uh, in many cases emotion plays a big part as we have seen. At the same time these emotions are in many cases uh, managed or it has the positive impact of the ethical expectations or the ethical behavior of the certain society where the people belong to, where a person uh, under consideration belongs to. And whether or not those ethical behavior is right or wrong, that can be open to discussion. The other interesting finding that the book talks about is our ethical behavior or our perceived ethical or moral behavior and our perception about whether things are right or wrong or what our feelings or emotions or intuitions are telling about it also based on the signals that we get from our group our peers or our society where we belong to. So the actual quest of finding the right answer may be very difficult and may be definitely uh, relative uh, from context to context. Beyond ethics, beyond um, the group uh, group signal about or community signal about whether a certain thing is right or wrong uh, when at individual level people are dealing with emotions and moods uh, in a professional setting we will be seeing managers or people in the workforce with different kind of personality how they will be processing and how they will be communicating uh, their emotions and moods uh, sometimes it's intense uh, and sometimes it's very um, indifferent and uh, both extremes are not good. Uh, the book talks about examples uh, related to the CEOs uh, of uh, Microsoft and Facebook and how their difference of personalities in showing emotions can have effect on their businesses. So that's an interesting example we can look into. The other thing that was uh, very interesting is uh, the studies, extensive studies made across different countries about how the emo human emotions and moods differ uh, in uh, the different time of the day or different days of the week. Usually what we have seen, uh, it's, and it's a very interesting finding, I suggest we look into this thoroughly, that there is a common pattern for all of us. We are usually happier in the midpoint of the daily uh, awake uh, period that we have. And uh, when we talk about uh, which would be the happier day of the week, usually uh, it's a no-brainer that uh, the happier people get when it's uh, towards the end of the week. And uh, of course, Monday is univers universally considered to be the saddest day um, in the workplace. 
Many people, including me, uh, sometimes think that uh, weather has a huge impact on uh, productivity, on emotions, on moods, uh, on my personal and professional life. Interestingly, uh, the book showed different and exhaustive research uh, and references which talks about that that's more like an illusion, uh, an illusory correlation of weather and uh, people's emotion. But at the same time, uh, we have personally, I have experienced uh, uh, some uh, countries uh, and some professional setting where weather is related to stress and sometimes social activities. Uh, in this slide, we are talking of also talking about stress. Uh, that is uh, al also covered uh, at length in the chapter that talks about that low levels of constant stress can worsen the moods and at the same time social activities has huge impact to play when it comes to controlling or impacting people's emotion. Now going back to the impact of weather, stress and social activities in uh, different Scandinavian countries during the winter time it's a uh, they use a certain sort of a uh, light which can imitate the sunlight which is necessary for people to be exposed to for a certain hours of every work uh, working day because uh, the people there think that it's very important for the workforce or the members of the society in general to be exposed to relatively better w weather or relatively uh, uh, brighter place because that can have a uh, positive effect towards having less stress and people can also then be helped to get more social. So that's the observation personally I had but the study in the book is saying otherwise. So I would suggest that in this case uh, people who are reading this chapter and this part will also have their own opinion and see how their opinion whether it fits uh, with the research that the researchers and the authors have shown in the book. Similar things with sleep and exercise. Uh, more sleep is better uh, to have positive impacts on your emotion. Uh, at the same time when we talk about exercise this is a uh, also very scientific. We are talking about when we are uh, doing physical exercise, uh, endorphin, this is the hormone it uh, secretes from the uh, body and that's, that helps the people to have positive feeling. That also works, endorphin works uh, similar to morphine uh, that um, reduce the perception of pain. So that's very, very important. So we can see that exercise and proper rest is actually better for better mood and emotions. This slide talks more on the other factors which can have impact emotions and moods. One is age. Older people, the book found, experience uh, fewer negative emotions. The book also talks uh, about the difference between different sexes uh, when it comes to dealing with emotions and moods. Uh, according to the book, women tend to be more emotionally expressive. Uh, they feel emotions more intensely, have longer lasting moods. But at the same time, I would strongly suggest to take these uh, studies uh, with a bit of a uh, pinch of salt because this kind of perception about the difference, behavioral difference between uh, women and men is also uh, it's highly subjective and it's related to the social expectation uh, and uh, it's related to certain so uh, different societies and how they perceive freedom, personal liberty and gender equality and empowerment. When we talk about workforce, uh, people in general who are working in different offices, production companies, uh, factories, or any places, in addition to the physical and mental labor, 
people are also investing emotional labor. And that, by that, we mean an employee's expression of organizationally desired emotions during the interpersonal transactions at work. So not everybody will be doing it, but there is a big chunk of workforce that has to have interpersonal transactions uh, uh, intensely with the customers. And definitely everybody or almost everybody in the workforce have to have interpersonal um, uh, interactions with their colleagues and others. So emotional labor is a huge factor. Now, the tension becomes, as we have seen in our previous sessions, uh, we talked about it, that uh, when we talk about job satisfaction specifically, that if there is a dissonance, if uh, the things that I'm feeling, I cannot express it, and I'm forced to express some emotions that I do not feel deep beneath, then there is, that can be a source of tension. And that can be a source of um, loss of productivity. And that can be very damaging in the long run and lead to burnout of the workforce. As we have seen in the slides and the session dealing with job satisfaction, here also, there are different types of emotions. One, the people uh, where the workforce individual and individual are feeling actually and what they're displaying in the surface. Sometimes people are hiding uh, emotion, inner feelings and uh, foregoing emotional expressions in response to the display rules. We see it uh, specifically uh, for the people in the customer service in the front desk who are dealing with customers. Uh, uh, sp specifically, when we talk about flight attendants or waitresses or waiters uh, in um, different uh, restaurants. And then the worst thing can be when one is required to have the deep acting where one is trying to modify his or her true inner feelings based on the display rules. And that can be very tricky and that can cause much more stress than the surface acting. All these deep and surface acting uh, is described in the chapter as effective events theory, AET. And uh, it's very important in OB for the managers and the leaders uh, and the HR to identify uh, different emotions of the workforce and how they're perceiving it and how they're being affected using this uh, effective events theory. This exhibit 4.5 describes AT. Here we are looking into different uh, characteristics of work environment and how this uh, environment can lead into different events daily. And in addition to this work environment, a person, when, it when he or she comes to work, he or she is also carrying their own personal experience, personal emotions or moods. And then together, it can have a positive or a negative effect. And that definitely has impacts on job satisfaction, and job performance. As we can see in the book and this slide that these emotion driven behaviors can be uh, typically brief and variable. It can vary. But more importantly, the thing that we need to understand is this both negative and positive emotions can distract workers and reduce job performance. So if we look into summarizing AT, there are two important messages. First of all, emotions are critical and it provide important information about workplace hassles and upli uplifting event, uh, events that can influence employees' performance and satisfaction. And emotions should not be ignored at work because they can accumulate and cause negative impacts in the professional performance and productivity.
the conversation of AT uh, in a theoretical way uh, to apply that and to practically see how it impacts uh, our workforce leads to another important thing in this chapter which is emotional intelligence by emotional intelligence or EI the writers here is talking about a person's ability to perceive emotions uh, of him or herself and others and also the ability to better understand those emotions not only just um, identifying those and then the ability to regulate one's emotions, control it, or guide it towards positivity. So these are all part of emo uh, emotional intelligence. And these are very... This slide talks about the cascading model of emotional intelligence. Here we see that conscientiousness, cognitive, emotional stability. These are very import important criteria uh, f to have for a person who has emotional intelligence or EI. And these things also enable a person to perceive uh, his or her own emotion and others and to understand the meaning of those emotions and then uh, regulate those emotions for positive cases. We have seen different examples in addition to the hypothetical or pra uh, in addition to the hypothetical and practical examples that we have mentioned in this uh, lecture session and also in the book. Uh, in practical, in real world, uh, if we look into the U.S. precedents, there have been a study where it showed that the successful U.S. precedents are the ones consistently with higher emotional intelligence. So all these uh, can have quite positive effect in, um, in a social or a professional setting. Saying this, EI is controversial and in many cases in academia and at the practitioner's level, you, EI is not uh, universally accepted. People who are supporting EI um, are saying that it's intuitive, it predicts the criteria that matter, and uh, it works. Uh, and we have seen good examples of this. But the, at the same time, uh, it's controversial because people think, researchers think that the definitions are too vague, and more importantly, it cannot be measured. And uh, people think that it's just we are talking about personality with a different label. So these are the controversies or confusions behind EI. The other thing related to EI, which is increasingly becoming more and more important and independent uh, factor to look into uh, on its own merit is the emotion regulation. We kept talking about it in previous slides where we are talking about identifying and modifying the emotions one feels. And here we have seen in the book that effective emotion regulation techniques definitely include acknowledgement uh, rather than suppression of one's emotional responses to situations and then reevaluate how things are occurring around them and in many cases uh, venting out expressing uh, the emotions and the m or the moods that the people are um, experiencing and uh, such things are very very critical uh, to have a transparent and effective way of uh, doing things and it also become very important when uh, uh, somebody is in addition to their own personal feeling also trying to take the lead to regulate other people's emotion or in addition to their own emotion. Now, we have seen in different uh, cultures, um, specifically we can cite uh, oriental culture here um, in countries like Japan, uh, South Korea or different Asian tiger countries where expression, uh, expressing uh, emotions uh, 
uh, has a lot to do with also pressure of social expectations. Uh, their people or the male uh, uh, workforce are not uh, expected to show the emotions of um, uh, vulnerability. Uh, and uh, that is uh, considered in many cases to be uh, the sign of uh, weakness. So that's something that need to be solved, that need to be addressed and need to be dealt with because sometimes the pressure of social, ex social expectation can definitely uh, result in a negative impact for the productivity of a company. In order to better understand the different critical factors of organizational behavior, it's important to hire people or select people in the workforce who has uh, higher EI. We can also see that these kind of people are specifically critical for the jobs related with uh, social interactions. In the decision making and also in terms of uh, ensuring creativity within the company, uh, people with better emotional intelligence can ensure uh, flexibility, openness, uh, and better creativity. People with higher EI can definitely motivate the workforce around them. And the le leaders who can deal with emotions aptly definitely can have uh, better time to make the people accept the messages from the organizational uh, decision makers. And in negotiation too, emotions can play a very important part. Uh, one can use anger uh, in a different part of negotiation and or uh, kindness or sensitivity in order to make sure that people who are negotiating uh, uh, on behalf of the company are better off. When we talk about customer service, emotion certainly has an influential role to play. Uh, it can define the level of repeat businesses and customer satisfaction. And positive and negative emotions have contagious effect on the customers from the service providers. Beyond customer service, when we talk about workplace behaviors, a positive and negative emotion can certainly affect the work, the workplace. If somebody is in a bad mood, definitely he or she is at risk of uh, harming uh, themselves and at the same time their colleagues and the reputation and the productivity of the company. When we are talking about people with the work where safety uh, is, is, is very important, and those can the work can be injury prone then definitely it's it's a mandatory highly recommended that we should not do the dangerous work when we are in a bad mood and in many cases it's uh, it's easier to say and very hard to follow because uh, people are assigned to do whatever they have to do and then it's the manager's responsibility to identify who are in uh, some not so stable emotional condition or not so positive emotional condition or could not uh, are, is not being able to concentrate on the work or the responsibilities at hand and so this is a teamwork that everybody needs to be take part in managers who are responsible to influence the mood uh, moods of their workforce for better productivity definitely can use humor or praise uh, among its uh, employees. Saying that in different countries and societies, it's very important when we are using humor or praise to better understand the so uh, social context and also the hierarchy within the workforce and in the society. Because in many cases, we have seen that uh, many humors are lost in translation 
in multinational companies where managers are from one place and managing the workers from multiple other places. Um, so that's, that's very critical when we are dealing with emotions of uh, the people within the human resource in the company. So it's important for the managers to foster positivity, especially in the service sector. It's, uh, it's, it's imperative that we encourage positive displays of emotion and that should make customers feel more positive and thus improve the customer service interactions and negotiations. And finally, it's very important for the managers to regulate their own emotional responses to any event uh, by recognizing the legitimacy of the emotion and being careful to vent only to, only to a supportive listener who is not involved in that event or managing uh, certain people or certain workforces. We s in many cases, the managers need to be objective about the way they see things and uh, they have to control the way they feel. At the same time, managers need to be careful not to ignore the co-workers and employees' emotions and they should not assess others' behavior as if it were completely rational. So that's it for this session uh, and for further case studies and uh, examples, I would suggest all of us to read the chapter. Thank you.